casual conversation between Skype interviews while the camera was still on turned out to be too dynamic, too painfully honest, and too good to not share with you. It is politically incorrect. It is challenging to hear. And it is with my good friend, America's beloved artist, Keziah Hancock. Please join us. Because I had the strong body to be able to work uh, 15, 16 hours a day, reconditioning 55 gallon metal barrels or uh, glass gallon jugs, you know, uh, I mean, I was a workaholic, but being a workaholic, see, now that wasn't something that anybody could get somebody to do. You couldn't beat me to work as hard as I worked. I worked willingly. I, you dang right, because for me to be out there working, it gave me dignity. It gave me respect. I was able to start uh, engineering some of my inventions and, and also to uh, a dang good reason to stay out of James Reed Stratton's effing bedroom. Yes, that's 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 damn straight. And so I did. I became a dang workaholic. Now here's the thing: with all this crap that that you know, Francis and her lying and and Reed with all his uh, sexual abuse and and uh, and insults and beating and all this stuff to that that uh, I wasn't able to. T tell anybody the truth because I'd get my head knocked off. But the thing of it is, here's the hand of God in it. This is the real damn Mormonism. Now, I, now why did the God that is God allow a, a, a young, naive, innocent kid like Miss Keziah to get sold into this slavery? How about for this very day, this very hour? that I stand up and call a spade a spade. No one can deny that I know what I'm talking about. And these people that live the sanitized version of Mormonism, guess what? They're in fairyland because I live the real damn deal. And the way that Francis did not want to feed me when I was just a little girl, that that made Miss Keziah, me, never turn away anyone from my door. If I had a tomato sandwich, if that's all I had, they was gonna, they was gonna get it. And uh, and and Reed, because he was such an a-hole, I learned to become a workaholic. That's a grand blessing, because you know what? Now I ain't beholden to nobody. I can sustain myself, and it's it's how I dare sit down and make a film like this. Because guess what? Like I said, I don't need to kiss nobody's ass no more. That statement right there is the foundation of why we don't have more women speak up. I hear all the time, well, why don't women just leave? Why don't they say something? Why are they backing and supporting it? You would back and support it too. If you were in a concentration camp, you would love your guards and tell everybody they're lovely because you have no alternative if you wanted to have a painless life, at least physically right. painless. You're going to have an emotional painful one anyway. But if you don't want physical brutality and starvation, you're going to tell the world they're lovely. It's like the people that love that little old leader of Korea. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You better love him if you want to live in that country. And you and I know that that is true. Yeah. What we have seen is not an isolated case. I've had people get violently angry about me telling about the abuse in polygamy. But in, Canadians, in Canada's biggest court case in the history of their country, Judge Robert Bowman had a research that was, took years to do about polygamy worldwide under any circumstances. Crime is higher in polygamy. Violence is higher. 
abuse is higher, neglect is higher, and lack of education is higher, lack of medical care is higher, lack of everything is higher in polygamy on the negative side, not the positive side. A woman cannot bond with a man under those circumstances. It's like uh, having having some glue on this board and then and, and having some glue on this board and you try to come together and, and, and you have a night or a week together. And then just as you start to bond and feel comfortable with each other, you're ripped apart. And then he goes to try to bond with somebody else and you're just like, you know. Now, when a woman is given in marriage to somebody that she has no love for. Oh, that's just great. Go. <laughs> Go be with that other wife. Oh, yeah, that's super. But when you love the man, ooh, I can't even think of anything more disgusting, more uh, horrific. It's, it's why uh, uh, people uh, kill under those circumstances, you know. It, it, it's not normal. It was never intended to be normal. Well, you know, if God would have wanted... Uh, a man to have more than one wife in the Garden of Eden. He'd have created Adam and Eve and, and uh, Betsy and Susie and, and Debbie and Doris and uh, Delane. He didn't do it. It was always meant to be one man, one woman, and don't try to mess with God because it's, 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 <sighs> I feel sorry for anyone that doesn't know the Bible well enough to know that they have rights and they do not need to put up with that malarkey. It's BS and they need to stand up and stop agreeing to be treated like a dang mushroom, kept in the dark and feed, fed BS. The, the public is being fed a lot of BS now in the pretense that gay marriages and polygamy can be compared and they're not. Uh, in gay marriage, at least there's two equal people. In polygamy, there's one alpha male and constantly dwindling wife positions. Wife positions that get skinnier and skinnier and skinnier for each wife. She gets less and less of a husband and more and more responsibility raising the kids all alone. The kids get less and less and less of a father the bigger the family grows. and Statistically, it proves that women age out and he's taking younger wives, so his older wives sooner or later are set aside. They may not be set aside as far as their money and work is concerned, but they're set aside as far as any real compassionate, caring time is concerned with their husband. When a woman gives consent for her husband to sleep with another woman, she is committing the ultimate stupidity. Here's an example. There's this guy had a nice wife, and uh, according to the brother, uh, he's supposed to take another woman so he can advance towards his BS godhood goals. Then he decides she really loves this other woman. She is good in bed. She, she takes care of his sexual needs right to the hill. And then this other woman dies. And what in the hell does this sucker say to, to his first wife? He says, ooh, I wish that would have been you instead of her. Because why? Because she was his favorite wife. And let me tell you what, there's always a favorite. I was just going to tell you, it's natural to have a favorite wife. I don't care what anybody says. I've seen polygamy. My family had five generations of polygamy. And always there was one woman that man preferred over all the rest. And there is no exception. That's right. That there is no exception because it's natural that you should prefer one woman or one mate over any other. The, the thing that we want to talk about that I want to point out here is the whole idea of polygamy being a choice. It is not a choice. Even in Islam and whatnot, they have honor killings for women that don't obey in our, in our fundamental belief. We had uh, blood atonements to save our soul if we didn't go along with it because we had a choice, but we had to suffer the consequences of that choice. And what comes down to, after a woman is uneducated and has several children, she does not know how to do what you were lucky enough to be able to do, and that is to make a living by herself and support her children. She can't keep her welfare check because her husband takes it away from her. That's a, a given. Just like 
my birth certificate, all of my father's illegitimate children's birth certificates are forgeries to protect my father from any legal responsibility. But there was no one on earth that would protect my mother from my father if she didn't turn that welfare check over to him. And there was no law on earth that would protect my mother's children from my father's visitation rights. Yeah. You know, even though he wasn't on the birth certificate. Well, and God. my father went to prison in 1945 with a couple of my uncles, my future father-in-law, and various other men tied into these same things we're talking about. And they let him out early if he would promise not to live polygamy so that he could take back the children of the child bride that had escaped from him. And she'd been killed in an airplane crash. And her family fought tooth and toenail in court and lost. The state of Utah gave my father back the children that she had escaped with on his promise he wouldn't live polygamy. And he took two more wives after that, of course. Sure. But he used that as an excuse to abandon the first and second wives almost completely. He, he, uh, he would come to take the welfare check for mom. I never remember my father ever sleeping a night in our house. I do remember him coming in the afternoon when he got the welfare check and ordering mother in the bedroom. And when, when he left, she'd always be crying. I remember that. He never ate a meal in our house because we were too poor and food wasn't good enough. Never in my life. Now, my story is not unique. Please tell me you know that. Oh, it's, it's the problem of it is, is it's, it, it just continues on. It, it happens over and over and over. And this was so damn sickening about it. You know, uh, the only thing that's ever going to stop it is the same thing that's ever going to stop Islam is when people are converted to Christianity and come to know Christ and he sets them free. See, Islam wants, wants, uh, uh, their followers to sacrifice themselves for, for the God of Islam. Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Hello? Isn't that beautiful? You don't have to blow yourself up. Hey, and Mormonism wants girls to be sacrificed, their virtue, their, their mind, their freedom, uh, all that gets blown up to Hades so that they can be obedient to these false gods, these false prophets. And make a man of God. And if, and if he does, he will pull them through the veil and, and into heaven. That's my, the lie. That's I, what he says. My father told me, the last time I ever saw him, incidentally, I had gone back to Utah and went to see him because he had been ill. Big mistake. He was up and you know by the time I got there, but he wasn't bedridden or anything. He was, just hadn't been doing too good. And he ordered me to bring my daughters back to Utah so he could place them in polygamous marriage. And if I didn't, he, not God, he, my father, would not resurrect me from the grave when I died. Yeah. And he told me how bad I'd been because I had left. And I said, uh, well, with, without any apology in my voice, I said, well, Daddy, I'm sorry that you disapprove of that. And his wife, Ruth, who is my age or younger, okay, she said, you can't talk to your father like that. And I said, well, I just did. And dad got so angry, he was shaking. He had his cane and he said, you apologize, you apologize. So I got down on my knees in front of him and without an ounce of apology in my voice, I was so angry, I didn't even know I could get this angry. I looked him right in the eye and mockingly said, oh, daddy, I am so sorry that I hurt your feelings by telling you the truth. And I thought, I really thought he was going to break that cane over my head. And you know, hey. I was so angry, I wouldn't have felt it. I never knew I could be that angry. He was shaking to keep from breaking it over my head. And then I, then I stood up. And I walked out the door and he's yelling yeah. and there was a two steps to go outside. There was a rose petal crushed on one of those steps. And I looked at that and I thought, 
fix that, Dad. See if you can fix that rose petal. <laughs> Resurrect yeah. the rose petal, Daddy, if you're so hot. And I, I never went back. I never saw him again. I never went to his funeral. I never went to the funeral of any of these buggers either. Yeah. I couldn't care less. You know, uh, good riddance. But the point being, we didn't have a choice. There was no, when I left, there was nobody, nobody reached out to me. This is why I just love Doris Hansen and what they're doing and try to do everything I can do concerning that. Uh, uh, nobody ever reached out to me. There was, I, there was nobody to help me. I was on my own, literally. Mm -hmm. I was totally on my own with six kids. And uh, it, uh, you know, and my, my heart goes out to women that are in bondage to be fed. Now, it's more than being in bondage just to be fed. I've seen cases over and over where women couldn't get their kids out, so they stayed. And it perpetuates itself. Where women who have never been able to support themselves by traditional means of getting a job, because they they had welfare checks, but they were working for God and didn't get to keep their welfare checks. So the only way they knew how to survive was to stay in that family unit and help each other. Whoever could work would bring something home. And I have a sister to this day that is bound and doesn't believe in polygamy anymore, but has no way to survive if she leaves and she doesn't want to experience the rejection of her children. She can't stand the pain. Yeah. So there she is. But what did Jesus say? He who loves father, mother, sister, brother, uh, wife, husband, child, and a uh, uh, cousin, neighbor, more than me is not worthy of me. No, sir. Christ. You know what? Uh, Ignorance is no excuse of the law. No, it isn't. Knowledge is powerful. And people need to search the scriptures, gain the truth, and stand up, speak up if you're going up. That's the whole point. The slavery is based on ignorance. All Absolutely. of it. If they, if they couldn't terrorize you, intimidate you, and beat you into submission mentally, emotionally, physically, and financially, it wouldn't work. But when you start realizing that you are being beaten into submission, that it isn't a choice, that it can't be right, that no just person, no just God, no justice would do that. None. Here's the thing. You know, uh, all the years that I was working, even though they was taking all my wages, what I was gaining, you know, is, is they could say, he could say, well, you know, uh, yeah, uh, Kaziah or May is the boss of the business, but I'm the boss of her. See, uh, he, he could do that. He could take all my money, but I knew that I had the knowledge. And the more that I figured out better, faster, and more economical ways of doing, and the more that I learned how to weld and have my welds hold and the equipment that I built to be able to be sustainable. Oh, I, you know, it, it was trying, it, you know, with all the bearings and the and the, the, the pillow uh, bearings and the sprockets and, and the design of all the things that I come up with. You know, the more that I learned, the more that I succeeded, there was an energy building up in me of independence. And the day would come, I'd need it. When I made my escape and I said, no more. And when I left a note in the, the, the mailbox of that old bugger as I slipped out through the back driveway and slipped into somebody's truck, and, and and then he uh, read the, the note and it just said, I have left. I will never suffer your abuse ever again. And if you want the rest of your family to stay with you, you're going to have to learn how to rule with something besides force. He was so freaking angry. He, he was ready to kill somebody right then. In fact, you know, there was a time when he seen me. Uh, pull out of the driveway, and immediately they got in the car and they followed me. I did some fancy ass driving. That was I was just hoping that a, a policeman would see me. For for instance, going into an intersection where your uh, your your signal and everything is to make a left turn, and then a minute's your turn to go go right. 
Oh yeah, because see, that bugger was right smack in back of me. And not only did I make a right, I sped out of there. Man, I hit the gas and biz. And then I started to zigzag and going inside and out of subdivisions and so forth. I lost that sucker. Yeah, because, uh, uh, you know, I, I was terrified. I, I, I was talk about so afraid I could pee in my pants. Yeah, it, it was... It was it was a terrifying moment, but you know what? Shortly after that, I got myself a blue healer dog and a thirty-eight caliber revolver, and I always kept that sucker loaded. And I learned how to use it. Yes, I did, because I just thought, you know what? You break into my house, unless you drop me first, I have every right in the world. My God, I will. I, you, you're dead, because you you ain't touching me, you bugger. That's right. I'll kill or be killed, but by God, I'll never submit to slavery ever, ever again. Feeling very powerful and strong about your position is a position that we had to arrive at before we could change our world. I've had a lot of people say, well, you can't really feel that strong about it. Well, you have to. I don't think you have the power to overcome extremely negative life and death odds if you don't finally reach that point that you are no longer afraid of dying that it no longer matters anymore you are going to change or else That's right. when I got out I was going to get my kids out or die trying I wasn't going to leave them and there was going to That's be right. no in between and I wouldn't have succeeded without that extreme uh, fixation if you want to call it determination absolutely absolutely extreme determination and I understand getting to that point where you say no more you can beat me you can have my dead body when you're done but you will not have my servitude right yeah uh, extremely uh, offensive and, and de uh, degrading degradation right humiliation to the extreme and you know uh, there's things that's worse than death right and, and see this is the thing um, people that have never been driven that hard they pretty much lived a pretty sheltered life in some ways and and that's okay but they they don't have the understanding and, and furthermore they don't have the understanding of why some people would commit suicide just to get out of the wretched mess See, I, I don't judge people when they commit suicide. I, I figure that's between them and God. Because I, I know how rough life can be. I was talking to my sister, Irene Spencer, just last month. And she named nine people that had committed suicide in our immediate family. In our immediate family. Yeah. I have one nephew who has two sons that committed suicide. And this was all because of the desperation of seeing absolutely no future. Right. Absolutely no future. It's assumed that only women have a hard time in polygamy, but that isn't true. These little boys are born in slavery, and only the favorite sons stay in polygamy. The sons usually of the favorite wife will stay in polygamy. That isn't entirely true all the way around, that only her children, but the sons that can make it go will stay in polygamy. The sons that are beaten and driven out because they might be competition for the young girls, like my oldest brother Roger. My dad beat him with a two before, and Lou Kelch had to pull him off to keep him from killing him. Roger ran away at 13 years old slept on top of the Woolworth building in the below freezing temperatures in the winter in Salt Lake City by the, by the heat vent that came up to keep from freezing to death, stole money from gum, gum machines so he could eat, uh, never, never came home except to see mom now and then when, when dad wasn't around, and dad hated him, just hated him, said he was no good kid. But dad did that sort of thing. Dad not only had a narcissistic maniac personality he was an extreme extreme um he was an alcoholic he had a drinking problem 
Well, here's the thing. If a kid doesn't suck up to the damn system, then, then uh, you know, it's like the Lost Boys of Shark Creek. Get your ass out of here. We don't want you. To, we don't need you. You know, if you're not going to uh, work for me, if you're not going to uh, earn money and, and, and uh, hand it to me, uh, then uh, and you're not going to obey me and you don't believe uh, that, that you're supposed to look to me as the ultimate power, then you know what? Just go. And, 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 and that's why they got rid of my brother. You know, it's the same dang thing. They, they threw him in the Provo Mental Institution because he got into a fight and knocked uh, Reed's teeth out. Yeah, and, and, you know, and they figured that that was a good enough excuse. But see, they had to program. That wasn't enough to do it. No, sir. They programmed mother. They said, you have to make up your mind. Do you want priesthood in this home or do you want it your damn son? Because you can't have both. And so they said, you know, You've got to uh, be willing to be 100% obedient. And what we're telling you to do is sign the papers to have your son committed. It's better to have him committed to the Provo Mental Institution than to have him get so mad that he kills somebody and then he'll go to prison for murder. At least in the mental institution, they told her he can get drugs and help and therapy. And so she, she was terrified. This woman with uh, four girls and a son, and she was going to be left without any help, you know, no, no way to get to the stores, no way to get to work, no way to uh, uh, get groceries brought in, Oh, she, yeah, and the fact that she believed in polygamy, she believed in Mormonism, so, you know, she, she did it, she done what they told her to do, my brother, he was sacrificed in, into the false gods of Mormonism. When you look at sacrifice, my mom sacrificed her entire life. She lived a very sad life. She suffered from depression a lot. And the depression ratio is very high in polygamy as well. Because it is a really hard life. It's a hard life. I'm very grateful to Keziah Hancock for her courage to allow me to share this video. I understand her passion her pain, her anger, and her courage. That's what made her what she is today. And she is a very beloved artist with more awards than most ever receive. And I'm grateful that I know her. Thank you, Keziah, for letting me share this video.